Welcome to this webinar on nitrous oxide and how its reduction can make a significant contribution to a net zero NHS. My name is Vivian Parry, I'm a science writer and broadcaster and personally I find this subject both fascinating as well as important and I'm guessing it struck a similar chord with all our audience because we've been overwhelmed by the interest. There are an awful lot of you on this webinar. Now, before I start, we'd like to say thank you to our host, BPR Medical. BPR have been developing innovative solutions for medical gas control since 1990. In 2021, they teamed up with Swedish company Medclare to introduce nitrous oxide conversion technology to the UK. As the manufacturer of the UltraFlow demand valve, which is used to deliver nitrous oxide in around 40% of NHS trusts in England and all regional trusts in Wales, BPR was concerned about the environmental impact of the gas and were keen to identify potential solutions. Thanks to BPR and Medclare, that technology was used for the UK's first climate-friendly birth in Newcastle last year, and it's now helping the NHS meet its net zero targets. So let me just take you through the programme for the next hour. First, we're going to have an overview from anaesthetist Andrew Goddard of the environmental impact of nitrous oxide, before another anaesthetist, Cliff Shelton, takes us through the technology and evidence of its effectiveness. We'll round off with two presentations. Yes, you guessed it, another anaesthetist, Emma Evans, about introducing it in the NHS, but also from an NHS head of sustainability, Sarah Taylor, including the all important making a business case. Now there's gonna be plenty of time for questions. And if there are any that we haven't had time to get to, the elves behind the scene will make sure that they're answered personally as soon as possible. For those of you who are watching online via YouTube, you're in the conversation by adding your questions either via the email address, which will be coming up on your screen now, or for those who are signed into their YouTube account, you simply put your questions into the chat box on the side in your YouTube, and some will be manning the chat so that we can answer your questions live on the forum. So let's get on with it. First up, Andrew Goddard, consultant and anaesthetist at NHS Lothian, who's always had a personal interest in sustainability. Now, Andrew, why is nitrous oxide such an issue? Thanks, Vivian, and thanks to BPR Medical. If we could have my presentation up, please. Okay, so next slide. I've got the topic of giving some background information uh, about nitrous oxide, uh, essentially outlining the problem as it looks today in the NHS. I'll start by covering some basics about nitrous oxide as a greenhouse gas, its use as a medical gas, how this translates into a carbon footprint, and attempt to quantify that somewhat. I'll mention some ways that we've been trying to reduce uh, our nitrous oxide use, and then I'll briefly move on to um, what and how feasible any alternatives may be, concentrating mainly on its use uh, within a maternity setting. I'll use obstetrics to illustrate uh, the occupational exposure considerations of nitrous oxide. And finally, I'll touch upon some ex personal experiences uh, when it comes to sensitivities around trying to champion responsible nitrous oxide use and options for reducing it. Uh, next slide, please. Nitrogen oxide is a greenhouse gas, meaning that within the Earth's atmosphere, it absorbs and then emits radiant energy within the thermal infrared range, thus contributing to the greenhouse effect. Once there, its atmospheric lifespan is about 109 years. It's important to think then that every molecule of nitrous oxide uh, that is given um, is, will outlive the person giving it and also the person using it. It's the fourth most abundant greenhouse gas in the Earth's uh, atmosphere by molar fraction uh, and the current tropospheric um, concentration is about 325 parts per million and that's increased by about 20% since 1750 and this increase since the Industrial Revolution is entirely anthropogenic and continues in a linear fashion. Due to both its molecular structure um, its efficiency as a greenhouse gas, its long-lived atmospheric lifespan and abundance. The global warming potential of nitrous oxide is about 273 times that of the reference gas carbon dioxide over 100 years. And finally, if that wasn't enough, nitrous oxide has a potent ozone depleting effect too and all the inherent health problems that come with that. Next slide, please. Inhaled nitrous oxide provides excellent analgesic and mild sedative effects. Many of its properties actually render it an ideal agent and for these purposes, it's cheap, non-combustible, easily stored and administered at room temperature. 
has a rapid onset and offset. It's effective, unmetabolized and unreactive with other medications with minimal side effects in the short term therapeutic use for the patient, uh, which may also include a baby, obviously. Its administration doesn't require too much additional staff training or patient monitoring. It's no, maybe no wonder then that it's persisted for about 250 years as either part of general anesthesia, but also to provide procedural analgesia and sedation in endoscopy units, dental suites and emergency departments, and of course, in maternity units for labor analgesia. Next slide, please. Most people will see in this pie chart, the total NHS uh, carbon footprint in England was estimated in 2020 to be about 6.1 million tonnes of CO2 equivalents, and that's scope one and part of scope two. 5% uh, of this is associated just with anaesthetic gases, and 80% of that um, is nitrous oxide related. Annually, it's estimated that that translates into about a quarter of a million tonnes of CO2 due to nitrous oxide, and by far the biggest users are maternity services being either mixed with oxygen as entonox or for its theoretical uterine relaxation sparing effect when given as part of an anaesthetic in obstetrics. As a direct admission, nitrous oxide falls within scope one, as already mentioned, where the requirement will be absolute zero rather than offsetting net zero. Next slide, please. Local data within NHS Lothian maternity units, uh, which appear to be reproducible elsewhere, reveal that about 70 to 80% of all deliveries use nitrous oxide at some point during uh, the birth process, we have estimated our carbon footprint uh, per delivery to be about 256 kilograms of CO2 equivalents. However, um, on one site, we discovered that about 80% of our nitrous oxide uh, never actually sees the patient, presumably due to loss um, in the system, but also due to poor stop rotation and returning of full or partially full cylinders. Um, and one site may have even had a carbon footprint per delivery of almost double that. Uh, when faced with our massive nitrous oxide uh, carbon footprint, we started the nitrous oxide mitigation project, which went back to basics. We studied clinician behaviors and beliefs and tried to establish if there actually was a role for nitrous oxide at all in modern anesthetic practice. We studied hospital schematics to understand which clinical areas were supplied with nitrous oxide and after engaging with um, clinicians, turned off and decommissioned almost all manifolds so far, saving not only on waste, but also on capital outlay for maintenance. We aim to decommission all nitrous oxide manifolds and offer portable cylinders on anaesthetic machines where clinicians still feel it is a requirement, such as in obstetrics and paediatric theatres. However, in the future, we may be able to change practice and avoid its use in these areas too. One additional step we've taken is when someone's using nitrous oxide and comes to a, a labour ward theatre, um, rather than using the anaesthetic machine to provide ongoing um, ent entonox, which gives a continuous flow of gas, We've now got mobile cylinders with a demand valve that will only supply gas on inhalation. Next slide, please. Alternatives uh, in labor when required can be less effective, such as the non-pharmacological options at the bottom of this pyramid, or more invasive than nitrous oxide, such as epidural anesthesia, uh, analgesia, or combined spinal epidural analgesia at the top there. They can be associated with undesirable side effects uh, for the mother and the baby, such as the injected opioids intramuscularly or intravenously via patient-controlled analgesias. Uh, they may require additional monitoring as a result. Additional staff time may be required too for these alternatives, which may be delayed, such as when an epidural is requested. And attending staff uh, may require further training in their monitoring and management. Nitrous oxide can be very effective uh, as a labral analgesia with, when time to contractions wears off in between. And for all these reasons, it's unlikely that nitrous oxide will be going anywhere anytime soon from maternity delivery units. Many of these same issues apply to potential alternatives uh, out with the maternity unit too, such as with more traditional bolus drugs like opioids, benzodiazepines, ketamine, uh, inhaled mesloxifluorine, uh, or infusions of propofol. Next slide, please. Nitrous oxide falls under control of substances harmful to health regulations um, and with the health and safety executive giving prescribed limits on occupational exposure. And this limits workers to 100 parts per million over an eight hour time weighted average. Long term nitrous oxide exposure is associated with several possible ill effects, including direct neurotoxicity causing neuropathy, myelopathy and subacute combined degeneration of the spinal cord. Similar effects are also thought to result from nitrous oxide causing vitamin B12 deficiency, uh, which can result in megaloblastic anemia. Nitrous oxide can also affect DNA synthesis, and for that reason, 
uh, it's been recommended that workers in the first and second trimester of pregnancy uh, avoid exposure. And this may explain the possible uh, subfertility and infertility seen amongst such workers. Although well known, it appears that only recently in the UK uh, there's this increasing awareness of these issues and drive for change. Occupational exposure uh, may be mitigated somewhat by active ventilation of delivery rooms or by anaesthetic gas scavenging systems supplying those areas to capture and remove exhaled gas. But these mechanisms do nothing to mitigate the harmful effects of nitrous oxide on the Earth's climate, which I've already outlined. Next slide, please. I think we do have to be a little bit sensitive, though, when discussing sustainability considerations for nitrous oxide in the maternity setting. We have to consider the possibility that highly vulnerable people who are suffering may not wish to know or be guilted about climate impacts of their healthcare choices. There's been some concern that um, publicity around the significant climate effects of nitrous oxide may risk its removal completely, and we must reassure them that this is not the case. People have a right to choose what analgesia they wish to use in labour. Should people in labour be burdened at all with the environmental considerations of nitrous oxide? On the flip side, often people are entirely unaware of these considerations, and some actually preferred to know when it was explained to them, and said they may have even chosen to use an alternative method of analgesia as a result of this knowledge as part of patient choice and informed consent. Next slide, please. So nitrous oxide, the bottom line, um, it's a significant carbon contributor and ozone depleter. As a scope one emission, we need to find a way of achieving, achieving absolute zero. It remains widely, widely used, especially in maternity services, where it provides um, an effective and safe labor analgesic. However, there are concerns for staff who are subjected to long-term occupational exposure. Medical use of nitrous oxide is a problem that can no longer be ignored, and we all have a role to play. It requires an effective, cost and time efficient, reliable solution against the mission and exposure to be developed, which can allow continued use where clinically appropriate. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Andrew. That was a, a really good overview. And uh, Humphrey Davy, of course, the original one of the original discoverers of nitrous oxide as a as an anaesthetic, has got a lot to answer for, I think. So how can these emissions be reduced? I mean, it's absolutely plain that there is a real case there. Uh, to introduce us to the BPR solution, and as importantly, to a study of its effectiveness, I'm pleased to welcome Cliff Shelton, who's consultant anaesthetist at Withenshaw Hospital, Manchester. Cliff. Thank you very much, Vivian. Well, it's nice to come and talk to you all, and I'll be introducing you to this device called the Mobile Destruction Unit, or MDU, uh, the thing that can break down uh, nitrous oxide. We've had a couple of these in our trust, Manchester University NHS Foundation Trust, for the last six months or so. And we've had the opportunity, supported by our sustainability colleagues, to uh, take some measurements in the clinical workplace to see how they perform with real patients, which, of course, is potentially a big concern because uh, labour is not known as a predictable and controlled experience. So there's reasons to think that this might be quite challenging to implement. So let's put my slides on and I'll talk you through a little bit of the context and then some of our work. So what you're going to see on the first slide is actually a colleague of mine um, posing with a demand valve, the thing that most women in labour will use to get nitrous oxide or gas and air. And if we just show the little uh, arrows when uh, she takes a breath in, uh, in comes a lungful of nitrous oxide and oxygen mixed. And when she takes a breath out with the next arrow, it's expired through that valve into the uh, room. So every breath uh, ends up going straight out into the atmosphere, but via the room that's got maybe the birth partner and the midwives and so on. Next slide, please. And as uh, has already been mentioned, there's a potential issue here, which is not only environmental, but occupational. So I, as an anaesthetist, don't spend a great deal of time uh, at the bedside for uh, women in labour, but my midwifery colleagues do. And there's a potential, if this isn't dealt with, that they will exceed those levels, which Andrew's already mentioned. Next slide. And we've also heard that there are some alternatives and actually this is my job as an anaesthetist to come along and uh, offer these things like Remy fentanyl and epidurals to people who request them. And that's absolutely fine and they're very effective. 
but I think the point here is that we couldn't just make a switch away from nitrous, even if we wanted to uh, overnight, because well, number one, the patients um, may not wish for it, I think, as has already been well outlined. But also, I'm not sure we've got the staff or the space or the monitoring to offer those enhanced um, techniques. So next slide, please. So this is the aforementioned MDU or mobile destruction unit. I'll just talk you through what this uh, box has got in it and uh, how it works. So if we just go through the animation. So first of all, it's got a catalyst in it, like a catalytic converter in your car, and it breaks down, uh, according to the manufacturer's data, about 99% of the nitrous oxide that goes into it. Next one, please. It takes about 20 minutes to warm up when you plug it in, but you can leave it plugged in, uh, for example, if you've got a room that's commonly used. Next one, please. You can see here that this is shown with a face mask, which is uh, what the manufacturer recommends. But we'll talk about that in just a minute in terms of alternative devices. Uh, next one, please. And this is the, the um, technology that BPR have contributed, which is this special uh, demand valve that's actually got a scavenging shroud. So as opposed to the one I showed at the start, this has got two tubes, one for the uh, gas and air to come in through and one for what the patient exhales to go out through. Next arrow, please. And you can see that the exhale gas is drawn in through that hose uh, into the box where it's broken down. Next slide, please. So when we got one of these, uh, we did a bench experiment just to see uh, what would happen in ideal circumstances. Now, you can't quite make it out from the photograph, but what that uh, shows is the MDU plugged into what we call a test lung. So it's basically a big set of rubber bellows that are used to test ventilators. And we use that to do simulated breaths of uh, gas and air uh, with and without the machine. And I don't know how well you can make it out uh, in the uh, results table next door, but you can see that at quite close range, we monitored the levels of nitrous oxide and we found that with the um, MDU, it was virtually undetectable. Without the MDU, there were levels that were maybe not above that parts per million, but they were detectable throughout the course of the experiment. So in ideal circumstances, it looks like it works well. But as I mentioned at the start, uh, labour uh, is uh, not well known for being predictable and we were very intrigued to see how it perform in the real world. Next slide, please. So this is one of our delivery rooms at the birth centre at Withenshaw Hospital. And um, we'll just put some arrows on to show you some key features. So here's uh, where our nitrous oxide and oxygen uh, outlets are at either side of the room. And another arrow shows that there's a nice uh, plinth here just next to the window. I should point out these windows don't open uh, where you can put a nitrous oxide detector. So this is how we did our, our study. And uh, if we put on the next uh, couple of little uh, animations, we set our nitrous oxide uh, detector to take a level every two minutes. And we monitored that during the last 30 minutes of labour for a series of patients. We picked the last 30 minutes because some people were in for a very long time, some for a very short time, but almost everybody's in for at least half an hour. So that allowed us to compare like with like. And we started off this project without the MDU, and then we introduced the MDU in a sort of stepwise fashion. Now, we've already had a bit from Andrew about climate guilt, and I think this is really important. So I just wanted to illustrate that, you know, when it comes to patient information in this particular context, it's got to be shortened to the point and easy to understand. But also note that we talk about our carbon footprint here, not the carbon footprint of the uh, patient or her baby. Uh, but we are appealing uh, to our patients to help us out with dealing with the trust's um, problem. And I think that's probably the way that this should be pitched in this context. Next slide, please. So here's the important bit. This is a thing called a run chart, and it's a way that lets you look at uh, data that's got variation in it. You can see on the bottom of the graph, the scale shows the cases. So this is our first 12 cases. And on the side of the graph, you can see parts per million of nitrous oxide. And this is uh, the readings that we obtained every two minutes, the average every two minutes in the last 30 minutes of labor without any um, destruction equipment. And you can see here that some of these levels are quite high, uh, up to nearly 200, and some of them are very low. And this indicates how variable people are in the way that they use these techniques. But we've drawn an orange line through the middle, and that's the median. So that's like an average of uh, what we have um, without any uh, destruction equipment. And it's around 45 parts per million. So not the sort of thing that would make your occupational uh, health officer, um, you know, really upset, but 
uh, something that's measurable and significant. So then we introduced the MDU and I've put a little picture of a mouthpiece above both of these sections of the graph because that's what our midwives tend to use. So historically, that's what we're used to with Ensure Hospital. And we decided we were just going to change one thing at a time. And we didn't expect this to work very well because we'd heard from Medclare, the manufacturer of the MDU, that they um, felt, and this is very rational, um, that covering both the mouth and the nose might cause uh, more exhaled nitrous oxide to be captured. But you can actually see that apart from the first of these eight cases where we use the MDU and the mouthpiece, all of them were below that initial median. And when you do quality improvement science, this is what's called a shift. So we've got seven points all below the initial median, and this is very unlikely to happen by chance. So this is a, a result that we think has arisen from using the MDU with the mouthpiece. But we wanted to then test it as directed. Um, and uh, if we can introduce the next part of the animation, you can see here that we used uh, what I would call a standard anaesthetic face mask. So this has got a, a sort of air filled cuff that goes over the nose, under the chin. Uh, and you can see that the graph kind of looks like it looked in the original state. And we thought that's very unexpected. But when we talked to the midwives, they said that actually these uh, masks can be quite claustrophobic uh, when they're used for a prolonged period of time. And these peaks uh, they thought were associated with patients who wore glasses, wore spectacles, because the air-filled cuff kind of gets in the way of them and stops the patient from being able to see. I thought that was a really obvious point, but one that I didn't figure out prior to uh, doing this work and talking to the midwives about what they observed. So then in the final stage, uh, if you can show the last piece, we just used a skinnier face mask. So I call this a low profile face mask that kind of fits under the glasses. And you can see that our graph looks very good here. And actually the number here is only 8.7 parts per million median overall. So this is um, a really uh, substantial reduction that we saw of nearly of, of around 80 uh, percent. So on to the next slide, please. So what did we learn from this? Well, I think there's a few things to take here. First of all, using the MDU uh, can result in a um, substantial reduction in the ambient levels of nitrous oxide. I think that's really important from an occupational point of view, and it's probably also really important from a climate point of view, but just bear in mind that we were measuring levels in the room and we can't quantify exactly how much of the nitrous oxide was broken down. The other thing, uh, to say is that it's possible for it not to work if you don't uh, implement it in a way that works for the patients and works for the midwives. And it was really interesting that the thing that our midwives have been used to using was actually highly effective. And when I talked to them about what that was all about, they said, well, we've been training patients for years to keep the mouthpiece in between their teeth and breathe out through it even though that doesn't really have a function when you don't have the MDU, but they said that helps people to focus and to uh, control their breathing. And it seems to be that effect that accounts for that effectiveness. And then the low profile mask pretty much does what the manufacturers expected. Um, it's just a little amendment to what we were initially delivered to work uh, in the particular context. So I think, uh, you know, technology works, but how it's implemented is really, really important. I'm just going to move on to my final slide now, which should be a QR code. And we wrote this up, actually, uh, Andrew, the previous speaker, was one of our, our co-authors. We've got some feedback from the midwives uh, in there as well. And if you want to point your phones at that, it'll take you to a copy of the study, uh, which explains in much greater detail than I could fit in in 10 minutes exactly what we did and exactly what we found. So thank you very much for your attention. And I'm looking forward to some questions later on, but I'll hand back to you, Vivian, just now. Thanks very much, Cliff. And actually, already we've got quite a lot of questions coming in. So do keep coming with those questions because you've got the experts here. So you've heard from, Kit that, uh, from Cliff that the kit can be very effective, but actually getting it into the NHS is another thing. And our next two presentations are going to look at the challenges. First of all, uh, the unique cultural and human challenges typical of maternity ward environments. And Dr. Emma Evans is a consultant anaesthetist at St. George's University Hospital, and she's got direct experience of these. So, Emma, a maternity unit is very, very different to some of the other environments that 
uh, gas and air entonox um, are, are used in like endoscopy. Very, very different. So is that a part of the one of the or one of the barriers to implementation? Thanks, Vivian. I mean, I think you're right. It's an environment that there's a much stronger view on um, becoming more normalised. Uh, you know, not all labour wards are the same. Um, and maternity units, I mean, certainly my own maternity unit has two completely distinct areas where one will be a, a bigger rooms where this technology is much easier to implement, but also almost in at odds with that is introducing something that feels like a piece of medical equipment. So I felt like the, the greater barrier was just the, the visual on having a large seemingly uh, you know medicalized piece of um, technology moving into an environment that was very much about mobility about low sounds low kind of a, a, a much bigger space to move around in um, and where you you didn't actually rely on medical equipment for your birth experience where you were much more empowered to 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 avoid all of those sorts of things and actually have much greater choice in how you were going to go through your labor and use analgesia so I, I kind of immediately knew when we got our units that there may be obstacles and that actually seeing how this might play out in a busier, more active side of the delivery suite might prove to be harder because the space was much tighter. I mean, the other side of that is also um, how do you how do you um, articulate the um, the benefits um, to a very busy group of people who are very short staffed? Um, and how do you deliver training that is meaningful without it feeling like you're asking them to do a lot more? So I think for me, it was the space, but also, you know, uh, how to create um, a learning environment with, within a busy labour ward, I think, have, have been the, the biggest challenges for me. I mean, a bit like, um, sorry, go on. No, no, I was going to say, and, and how noisy is it? Because you, if you've got something that looks a bit like a generator in the corner, you expect it to make a huge noise. Well, I think that's the bit. You you wheel them in, and um, and I think everyone expects it to sound like a, a you know a, a, a massive generator going on, and they are pretty quiet. They're they're silent, and I think that becomes a huge surprise to the people using them. Um, and the other bit that came as a surprise, although we haven't done as much work as Cliff has clearly done in terms of the obstacles of glasses. Um, is that the anaesthetic face mask again was seen to be a very very medical thing it was so odds with the training around using mouthpieces that that was felt to be um something that felt like you're really really are pushing your luck here in terms of trying to implement this but actually people have surprised themselves they've actually the women haven't really had any issue at all with um, a face mask in the much smaller group of people that we've used them in so far um and so far they haven't really noticed that even a piece of equipment is in the room that shouldn't normally be there. So it's so far so good. But it, I, I did feel that it was us. We were potentially destroying that environment by having a piece of equipment like this, but it hasn't proven to be the case so far. Now, in the UK, we use a lot of gas and air and, and that actually makes us a bit of an outlier, doesn't it, across uh, Europe? And we seem in the UK, I mean, perhaps because of good old Humphrey Davy, but we seem to have this cultural affection for gas and air. I mean, you're you're right. I mean, this was a at the turn of the century, and and prior to that, this was um, something that was part of a party. Uh, you know, uh, nitrous oxide has a, has a reputation and was then coined as laughing gas for a reason. Um, so its introduction into society was very much around it not being something to be feared, but something that was quite enjoyable. Um, and I think overall, we have not had the same kind of view, I think, as potentially the United States around it being a medical gas outside of anaesthetics, you know, as an anaesthetist, and I'm sure my colleagues here will attest to, this was very much part of, and I'm possibly a bit older than them, a part of my training, you know, nitrous oxide with an anaesthetic had many, many uses, um, and it was the mainstay of older anaesthetic agent use. But I think we've moved on from that within anaesthetics, but it, the, we, we have kept nitrous oxide because it is so versatile, and I think Andy outlined that quite well. It's portable, works quickly, it wears off quickly, and it creates a really great adjunct to breathing techniques, which have become a much bigger part of women's um, plan for birth analgesia. And it's almost seen to be not a medicine. 
in other words mm. it's just a bit of extra support now, one thing I, I think which is an elephant in the room uh, for me is that um, when women are in the middle of uh, labour, environmental focus is not at the top of their mind. <laughs> There's a lot of very blue language in maternity units. <laughs> and the idea that you could suggest that, you know, you're not having your gas and air because actually it's bad for the planet might not go down terribly well. No, and I think... Um... I agree with the the use of the language that Cliff had on his um, unit. I think this is something that you can talk, well, we should be able to talk about, but I don't think it's at the time when you're in labour is the moment at which you start to introduce the idea that maybe you want to think differently about this. It may be something that we can introduce into um, our classes, but it may not be something that is as black and white as you shouldn't use it. And I think the other speakers have alluded to that as well. Um, I think education is at the core of this and I think as much um, women and their birth partners as well as our staff and with that knowledge and with that understanding I think we might find that we start to reduce some of that nitrous oxide use and actually if we, we might start to ask questions about what resources we need within a delivery suite to enable women to have the experience that they need but without necessarily using as much nitrous oxide because what we're doing here is obviously breaking nitrous oxide down whereas actually at the top of our waste hierarchy when we look at interventions within sustainability we really want to reduce things first so um, we want to make sure our waste processes and everything around leakage of nitrous oxide within pipe work which Andy talked about have all been managed as well and um, so we need I think we need to let women know that we are doing all of those other things too and that taking nitrous oxide away from them isn't the only thing that's happening. So there's a very clear message coming uh, from you and indeed the other speakers that you cannot pile this responsibility onto labouring women. You know, it has to be it, it, it has to be sorted out for them, um, if you like, uh, before. And what I'm also getting from you is this sense that education, both of uh, the midwifery workforce and in advance and also with women is essential you know whatever has been done in terms of effectiveness unless you sort out the education this isn't going to get implemented yeah I mean I think without that it's very difficult for any of us to understand what tangible difference this makes because we talk in very technical terms about carbon dioxide equivalents and car your carbon footprint. And I think we are fully immersed in this as people who are um, trying to lead in different areas of this work. Um, but actually, it doesn't mean very much because you don't see a difference in what happens to you as a woman in labour and you don't see a difference in what happens to your baby in labour. And those are your fundamental priorities. So I think that it's it's all of us working together and sharing you know within forums like this that will prove to be i hope well, i hope prove to be helpful um in in working out what language we need to use because language is also so important in maternity that's super helpful indeed uh thank you uh, so much now finally let's hear from sarah taylor estates transformation manager and head of sustainability at friendly health nhs foundation trust now sarah I imagine that you've got multiple scars on your back from long involvement with developing business cases. So your experience is really valuable to us. Where would you start and what are the most important elements? Well, I think my colleagues that have been on here, Andrew Cliff, um, have actually started that off for us. Um, if we can go to my first slide. So just a little bit of background on Frimley. Um, we serve about 900 thousand people across Berkshire, Hampshire and South Bucks. Um, we also have um, diagnostic services at Old Shop, Farnham Fleet, Windsor and Maidenhead, etc. And we create basically 144,000 tonnes of carbon each year. So as part of sustainability, it's my job to try and reduce that in line with the net zero carbon requirements of the NHS. We're looking to basically become net zero um, target by 90% by 2035 and reducing also harm to health from carbon emissions and environmental degradation as currently quickly as possible. So we looked at ways we can do that. Next slide, please. So we have nine green area plans of focus within our trust. 
um, estates, travel, food, supply chain. Um, but the one that we major on is medicines. Um, and we looked at how we can tackle that. Next slide, please. So we went and had a look at our uh, medicines priority green action plan, which include medicines optimization, environmental impact assessments, uh, looking at desflurane, sulfurane, um, and encouraging anaesthetic teams to use um, different types of anaesthesia. But we also looked at then doing our nitrous oxide waste audit across all trusts. And from that, we looked at the maternity needed to reduce the amount of nitrous oxide emissions. Um, and by doing that, we then went and had a look at how we could do that. Next slide, please. Now, I won't bore you with this slide because I'm sure many on this um, pet will have seen this a thousand and million one times um, and can probably do it better justice than what I can. But basically on here, we're looking at scope one for us for the anaesthesiast that could, and it covers seven GHGs, carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous, fluorocarbons, etc. Next one, please. So from that, we had a look at the carbon footprint, and as we can see that procured pharmaceuticals, equipment and everything else is larger than our energy on our building and travel and commissioned. We then had a look at how much we did trust-wise ourselves. Next slide, please. And while we've managed to reduce all our desflurane, our nitrous oxide still produ um, produced through our um, audit quite a lot of our gas by tonnes. So 20% of the trust direct emissions from all activities, including gas, oil, were still anaesthetic and anaesthetic gas um, carbon emissions. When we did our audit, we looked at most of it was coming from our maternity department, and that was split 50-50 between portable cylinders and piped. I know many trusts are now going against piped and just going to cylinders, and that's something that we'd be looking at going forward ourselves. Next slide, please. Um, basically, as we looked at the medicines as a regional priority, we and the, look, the amount of nitrous oxide we were using and the, um, through the Entenox and the maternity department, we decided that we wanted to look for mobile destruction units. Now, we've got two birthing centres within our trust, um, three at Wexham and three at Frimley. We're coming up um, the correct amount that we needed to order for our departments. Basically, because these are mobile, we can wheel them into the rooms as and when required. And therefore, it doesn't mean that if a, um, a lady giving birth um, doesn't want one in her room, it doesn't have to be there. Um, and it gives her the option of whether she wants to do it or not. Um, why did we choose this? Um, basically, because we'd already done our research and we'd looked at what had been done in Sweden and what had been done in Newcastle upon time. And we could from those we could see that it would cut our emissions by 75 percent reduction in our nitrous emissions for our birthing mothers and also for our staff so it helped created a well-being center for them while they were giving birth as um, the other speakers have alluded to some people might be in there for th 30 minutes and some mothers could be in there for at least eight hours if not more so how did we manage to get our money next slide please Unfortunately, there, um, there is no golden leaf tree that you can go and take your money from. It is going to be hard work. We were lucky that we'd put a business case together, but then our CCG um, within their yearly budget had enough money to make to basically fund these for us. So our job within our trust was quite easy um, and we had a clear way through. But these have now changed. There is no more CCGs available. So if you go to the next slide, please. I'm again, I'm not going to bore you with this, um, but I'm sure these slides will be um, reduced, um, released to you. So basically, the CCGs have gone and we've been replaced with ICBs, ICSs, ICPs, players and neighbourhoods. This slide is just basically showing you the relationship between them and how funding might um, be started in one section and or another section. Next slide, please. So as I alluded to, we got our money through the CCG, but 
before that we put a business case to be able to get through to our executive and everybody else the need for these machines next slide please what we'd suggest on a business case and not a business plan a business plan is basically when you use it to go and create a business um, you need to articulate what you're wanting and why you're needing it so therefore there are steps that we need to take and you need to understand your audience on that business case and write it in such a language and it may be that you need one for your technical team and one for your non-technical team just that they can understand at their level and you're not bombarding them with terminology they do not understand in your business case always please do put a if you're going to use abbreviations put a page in there so that people aren't sat there not understanding what you're just trying to discuss and what you're trying to get over it confuses them and they'll just reject it straight away so it's essential that any business case um, is proposed to create and your wide range and your objectives of what you're trying to do it's equally important that key stakeholders such as budget con holders are consulted even in the first thoughts of even writing a business case they are going to be the people who are going to back you they are going to be the people who understand what your your objectives are and they will also be able to provide you information like cliff has with his audits and his information they are going to be the people that if you're heads of sustainability or your estates you're going to go to for the information to help you they're also going to be the guys who will put the audits in place in your trust to actually see where your your requirement for these machines are now there is no surefire template for any business case some some trusts have a template that they'll expect you to write some have none you just want one that flows easily for what you're trying to achieve next slide please um, it might seem time consuming but it's not complicated. If you get the bones down and what you're wanting to achieve, it will help you. What is the purpose of the project? Who's working on the project? What does the project connect to your organisational goals and objectives? What metrics are you going to use to measure the success of the project? Who is working on the project? When is the project going to start? When is the project going to complete? What mitigations are you going to be putting in? make sure you pitch it right make sure you answer the basic questions don't be scared to send your business case to a number of departments and get them to answer and ask you questions so that you can include those in your business case biggest advice is just share advice go on to futures if you're nhs go and speak to your anesthesiologist. go onto the internet go to a number of people they will share that advice with you don't be scared to ask we're all working to a common goal we've all got to be net zero we've all got to reduce our emissions some of us are ahead of the game some of us are in the middle of it some of us are starting out but we all started we were all that learner driver at one point and we're all know where you've been we've all gone through the bad and the good times and we're happy to help next slide please so as Cliff said before, make sure as part of your business case, you include a period of data, audit, analysts. Uh, it can be time consuming, but if you get it right and you do it, then you're going to be able to um, make your um, business case more um, inclusive. And you'll also look at the SMART objectives. Be specific, be measurable, be achievable, realistic and timely. Benefits are also associated with costs, but there are also risks. Make sure you answer those risks. Don't be scared to not include your risks in your business case and how you're going to mitigate, because sometimes that becomes a benefit as well. Also analyze your quantitative and your qualitative outcomes and present these differences that you've made. Next slide, please. Now you can do a comprehensive audit which includes everything and anything on your uh, medical gases like this one that the BOC do. You don't have to go to the BOC. You, you can do just a nitrous oxide audit. But if you're looking at looking at all of your gases, it may be worth actually going and doing one of these full audits and actually having them look at 
your cylinders, your pipe network, your emergency, your, your manual handling, making sure that your cylinders aren't half full when they're going back and that you're wasting all that nitrous. You've got to work smart. Next slide, please. Um, I think these have already been covered by my colleagues. So um, one of the questions you'll probably get asked is, why do we not simply stop using nitrous? I think my colleagues have covered that a lot better than what I have, so I'm not going to go back over that one. Next slide, please. Why did we use Medicare? Because the machines are removable. They're not a static scavenger unit that you put into your room. They um, can be moved into each of your rooms. So if you're looking at maternity and endoscopy, it may be that you have set hours when endoscopy might be being used and you can give a couple of machines over to them and then they come to maternity afterwards. Um, we chose maternity because that's where most of our nitrous is used. And as I said before, they can be used for up to eight hours a day or for the average length of a child. That's equivalent to driving 600 miles in your car, unlike me who drives a Land Rover and that would probably be only 200 miles. Um, there's been several studies, like I said, that you can use in your business case. There's BMJ. There's, there's so much out there. Um, last, next slide, please. And if I haven't bored you enough and you want some bedtime reading on how to take undertake a business case, there is also the Treasury Department and the government, which has a, a document there that will help you go to sleep if nothing else does. Next slide, please. And that's the end of my presentation. And Sarah, that was fantastically helpful. And and actually, this is low hanging fruit, really, in some ways, isn't it? I mean, this is you know, nitrous oxide is a substantial part of uh, the 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 anaesthetic gas burden. It is. I mean, the, the most easiest one is getting rid of desflurane, um, and most trusts have already done that uh, and achieved that. So the next one along our lines would be the nitrous. I know um, there are other ways of deleting or removing nitrous by using um, other types of technology, but for maternity, it's not going to go away. Your mothers for years and years have always used gas and air. I, I, I can remember I've, I've had two children and the first thing most mothers um, walked in and went, where's my gas and air? Um, it, it's a go to for them. It's something that they feel comfortable in. Um, if we can help the environment, but still help them have that comfort blanket that they may feel that they need, then but we're achieving what, we, what we need to do. To do. So I, but there are lots of questions coming in. So let me um, throw some out to you. Um, so uh, I think this one is for Cliff. Apart from obstetrics, can it make a lot of difference in a normal operating theatre? I haven't used nitrous oxide for 20 years, but I understand paediatric colleagues use it and find it useful. Um, so I think, thank you for the question. I think there's a, there's a, it's less clear. It's much less clear for a few reasons. So one is that um, using nitrous oxide in the operating theatre, it's rarely used as a standalone agent. There's normally some other stuff in there as well um, that Sarah was just mentioning, things like sevaflurane and desflurane. And uh, as far as I'm aware, although colleagues may uh, correct me on this, you can't put sevaflurane and desflurane into this um, machine. So you'd have to be doing a pretty strange kind of anaesthetic involving nitrous and then something that went IV for this to work. And I think if you're giving something intravenous, you might as well give it all intravenous. So I, I think in my mind, the, um, in, the nitrous oxide uh, has probably had its day in the uh, intraoperative um, use. I've not used it uh, since I was a very junior uh, trainee anaesthetist. There's lots of good alternatives to it. And paediatric colleagues, um, you know, they, they have a tradition of use, but it doesn't need to be used. So I think the uh, the way to deal with the operating theatre is to largely uh, get rid of piped nitrous and maybe have a few cylinders for specific indications. I see this as a much more useful technology in the maternity setting where, as everybody's mentioned, it's quite hard to get rid of uh, gas and air because uh, we've got used to it as a service and the patients uh, have a, often have a preference for it. 
Yes, and we should never forget patient choice because that's a you know central element in the NHS. Um, uh, uh, Andrew, we, we've had a number of queries about this, and I indeed I found it myself. Um, what's the best source for global warming potential figures for nitrous oxide? Because I've looked at a lot of different sources and they all have a slightly different number. Is there a definitive number? Uh, the answer is no to that. So yeah, I've seen it vary from about 265 to 298 times the uh, equivalent of the reference gas carbon dioxide. And, and it depends on what source you look at. There's um, NHS England sources, there's um, you know the government sources, uh, there's American sources. So it, it just depends where you look. And um, I'm not sure, I've not looked at the background of how they've come down to those actual figures and it may be due to the way that things are measured or when that data was produced um, that, that which may explain the difference so a ballpark figure would be around 265 times so but so absolutely worth saying in a business case that there is a, a range and it from this to to that so the easy answer <laughs> is it significant yes it's very indeed. large yeah indeed uh so um this is an intriguing and, and i'm going to come to you Emma, on, on this i'm not sure that you may know the answer to this but somebody's asking would mdus be viable for use in ambulance fleets well uh, and i i would say the answer to that question is it depends on how small you can get a, an mdu in an ambulance fleet i know that medclare are working on a portable solution for exactly that but I also know that um, Penthrox, which is an alternative to nitrous oxide, is used much more in a pre-hospital setting and also in emergency departments as an alternative inhalational um, analgesic, although it does have a two hour, I think, and again, I can be corrected by other colleagues, a two hour window for its use. You can't use it for long periods of time. Um, and um, it does have um, a much lower carbon footprint, so it's it's a kind of win-win, but it is licensed for an acute setting rather than, you know, a planned setting. So it, it has almost the perfect environment is in, a, in an ambulance. But I do know that there should be some units that will, um, I think, are in development, have been patented, um, that may help nitrous oxide to be destroyed pre-hospital. Um, but I think watch this space, that probably is for Medclare to answer ultimately. Um, Cliff, a bit of confusion about what Entinox is. Uh, just uh, let me uh, just give us a definitive answer. Um, is Entinox good for the environment? And I think people are not quite sure what proportion of Entinox is actually uh, nitrous oxide. Yeah, so, so Entinox, there's two brands of nitrous oxide oxygen mix that you can buy in the United Kingdom. Uh, and they are called Entinox and Equinox, and they're both the same thing. It's 50% nitrous oxide and 50% oxygen. Uh, these are designed for use in uh, patients who are awake, so not under general anaesthesia, and they tend to be used for painful things like labour and procedures, as colleagues have talked about. Um, so so that's, that's the way they're delivered. In the operating theatre, we have pure nitrous oxide and we blend it using an anaesthetic machine and we can vary the concentration, anything up to 80 percent, anything down to zero percent. Uh, but that's only really safe if you've got continuous observation and so on. Uh, is it good for the environment? No, I'm afraid it's never good for the environment. Um, and, you know, even if you use the MDU to break 80 percent down of it, 80 percent of it down, it's still not very good for the environment but it's 80% better than it was to start off with. So I think there's a very significant impact that can be uh, achieved. But if you were to assume that level of breakdown and stack it up against, say, you know, an injection of some morphine, a little syringe of morphine is going to be uh, less. So I think it's not uh, good for the environment, but you can make it a lot better than it would be without uh, the destruction technology. And Andrew, I think you provided the most gobsmacking statistic of this whole webinar, which is that 80% of nitrous oxide does not reach the patient because it's wasted or it's left in, in you know, half used cylinders and all that kind of thing. So there's clearly a lot of work to do there. 
So that's where a lot of my own involvement came from, to be honest. And we called that the nitrous oxide mitigation project. And that started in um, uh, NHS Lothian, spread to across Scotland and now throughout the whole UK. And if people are looking for more information on that, they can go to the Royal College of Anaesthetists and Association of Anaesthetists website and look for a nitrous oxide mitigation project. And it'll explain the whole process from the ground up of looking at your schematics in your hospital. Where does we had nitrous oxide being supplied to radiology? And intensive care and it's just you know as long as I can imagine it's not being used there and we we did pressure drop testing where you got um, the hard facilities management team to put in a, a um, pressure measuring device into one of the Schrader outlets and you look at the pressure drop when you isolate that part of the pipework so there was we knew there were leaks going on to places that were not being used clinically so you could easily switch those off and save those leaks um, you know absolutely and so, uh, Sarah, you need to, uh, uh, as you suggested, make sure that you've done all that kind of spade work so that when you're doing your business case, you made it clear that actually you've already done an audit of the most obvious things that you can do. And this is your your next step. Yes, that's correct. Yeah, um, we on the took our audit, we, we looked at all the departments that used it. Um, our first step would be to remove the pipe services and then to look at what areas actually need to have the nitrous in and then how we can mitigate it. We're never going to be able to get rid of it. Um, so, yeah, the audit is the first step. And a very quick and final uh, question uh, for Emma, because um, I don't think that women are really aware of this issue uh, at all. So is there work for the consumer press to do, for instance, to talk about this issue much more widely, whilst not making people feel guilty? Um, I think there probably is, but I think it's a it, it's it's something we all need to get involved with and probably women need to get involved with to help that language um, part of it um, to be just pitched in just the right way because I think it's very very easy to frighten women and it's very very easy to guilt trip them and to blame Sorry. as well and, and guilt to blame trip. and that's yeah. really not what this is about at all um quite a few yeah. of you are asking questions about the cost of an MDU uh, if you've got queries about prices please contact sales at bprmedical.com and we'll also be following up the webinar with some further contact information. Now, I think that actually uh, brings us to the end of this webinar. Can I just say to uh, all our speakers, uh, thank you. You've really provided some fantastic information and I hope that all of you who are listening have found it helpful and that you're not so horrified and frightened by the business case, which I know some of you will have to uh, be writing in the near future. So once again, thanks to BPR, thanks uh, to our splendid uh, guests this evening, and it's bye for now. <laughs>